All right, guys, welcome back to the CS Classroom. Uh, today what we're going to do is topic two, which is computer architecture. Now, this topic is probably the most demanding topic out of the non-programming topics. So we've got topic one, two, one through three, which are theory, and topic four, which is programming um, on the SL side. And yeah, I would say topic two is the most challenging. So without further ado, let's get started. OK, so firstly, um, what is computer architecture? So in talking about computer architecture, particularly in this topic, we're going to be focusing on what goes on physically in the computer itself. So how different components work together, uh, how the CPU works, uh, storage, meaning RAM, hard drive, stuff like that, and the role of the OS. Now we're going to start with the CPU or the central processing unit. Um, we can consider the central processing unit to be the brain of the computer. It's responsible for processing all instructions that are sent from other from computer programs, from peripherals, etc. cetera. Um, any action is executed in the CPU um, and any arithmetic or logical calculations that are done, I guess it wouldn't be a logical calculation, but any arithmetic or logical operations that are done are done in the CPU. So this is basically where all the magic happens. Now, an example of how the CPU works would be a computer program. You click on an X. Uh, that X triggers a certain piece of code. Um, that code is executed by the CPU, and as a result, the, we exit the program. That's obviously a very like high-level description, but in general, that is the role that the CPU plays. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to go through how a CPU works, and this is sort of a a long and multi-step process that you need to know. Now, we're going to be following, well, um, like basically every CPU follows the von Neumann model. And we're gonna be describing how that works in kind of a high level. So get a coffee like I did and strap in. Now, where we're gonna start is the PC or the program counter, okay? Now, basically how this works is we, so basically anytime we open a computer program, the data for that program goes into the RAM. The RAM is known as random access memory. And basically all the instructions for that program, all the data for that particular program are loaded into RAM. And in RAM, they're organized into an address and the resultant data. So each address holds some data, some binary data, that corresponds to that program, to the operations of the program. Basically, the code that runs the program is going to be stored in RAM in the form of this data, this data right here, and in binary. So what the program counter does is a program counter repetitively goes through all the addresses in RAM and executes the instructions. So it's basically just going through and doing the work that has been assigned in the RAM. Well, not doing the work, but I guess, okay, it's going through and it is identifying which addresses are going, are going are next to be executed in the RAM. So how that works is the program's counter sends an address to the MAR known as the um, memory address register. Now a register is just a small piece of memory. It holds, uh, it holds data, um, the number, it holds data in a very small amount. Uh, but it's also very fast. So for example, let's say we want to go to address zero. Now in reality, in RAM, addresses are stored in hexadecimal format. So it would look like X, six, FF, something like that. But for our purposes, let's say that the program counter is sending zero to the memory address register, okay? So what's gonna happen is through the address bus, which is just a wire, we're gonna send zero to the RAM, and then we're gonna get this piece of data out of the RAM, this 1010. And we're going to send that back through the data bus to the MDR, known as the memory data register. So that's being sent through the data bus. Um, and also through the data bus, we're going to send that piece of data, this 1010, to the control unit. And it's going to be stored in the current instruction register because that is the um, instruction or the piece of data that's about to be executed. Now, what happens as well is this 
uh, this data right here, so this 1010, zero, one, zero, gets translated. Now, usually that data is not going to look exactly like this, but what it's going to do is get translated or decoded into another format that is readable by the AOU up here. So we're going to decode our data, and then we're going to send it up to the AOU, which is the arithmetic logic unit. Now, the arithmetic logic unit is where any is where this data, the operation represented by this data right here, actually gets executed. So whatever that 1010 zero, zero means, the action that that represents gets executed, gets done in the ALU. As a result, from the ALU, we'll output either to the monitor, somewhere else in the computer, or we'll store something back in the RAM for further execution. And while the ALU is performing whatever logical or arithmetic operation is necessary, um, it will use the accumulator, the ACC, the accumulator, as sort of a place to keep data in between doing calculations. So it's like a little storage box that uses when it just needs to put something somewhere temporarily. So in conclusion, we're going from the PC to the MAR. We're sending a, um, a memory address from the PC to the MAR, um, the, MAR, the MAR to the RAM, and then the RAM is sending data to the MDR, the memory data register. We're just sending it to the CIR, to the CU of the CIR. Um, and there, that data is being decoded and then sent to the ALU, where the accumulator also exists. Now, a few other things. Um, so the CU, the control unit, also controls or orchestrates this entire process. So if this whole process was an orchestra, the control unit would be responsible for making it all uh, work in sync. There are other components inside the control unit you can't see in this diagram. Um, in fact, a real sort of CPU is much more complex than this, but for the purposes of the IB and for the purposes of someone who is not a, um, an upper level undergraduate or graduate student, this is as much as you need to know about the CPU. Now, these slides will be posted um, in the description below. But right here, we can, I can also show you a, uh, a list of what's going on. So if you find it difficult to follow my explanation on the other slide, you can go ahead and take a look at this list and match it up with the diagram. You do need to know this entire process along with what all of these components are uh, for the IB exam. There will be questions where you are asked to describe what the role of, for example, a memory address register is or a memory data register is um, or other components in the CPU. And just to review, the program counter was to tell um, basically the CPU what address in RAM to access next for data. The memory address register sends an address to the RAM um, to be accessed. The random access memory holds current program data in the form of an address and data. The memory data register receives that data uh, from the RAM and passes it on to the control unit where it is decoded and then sent to the arithmetic logic unit. So the control unit both does decoding and controls the overall process, which is called the fetch decode execute cycle, or FDE cycle. Um, it's also called the machine instruction cycle. I've seen both in the IB exam. Fetch is going to be this part right here, fetching the address, or actually probably this part, fetching the data from the RAM. The decoding happens right here, and the execution happens in the ALU, or the arithmetic logic unit. Now, a few notes. The FDC, the, again, as I said before, the FDE cycle or the machine instruction cycle is orchestrated by the control unit. Uh, there are two core, if there are two cores in a computer, maybe you've seen um, before that there are, uh, you know, like a multi core or a dual core processor. That's talking about the number of ALUs in the processor. Um, the processor speed is the number of FDE cycles per second. So, for example, if you see a computer with a 2 gigahertz processor speed, that means we're talking about 2 billion FDE cycles per second. And again, the FDE cycle is called, is also referred to as the machine instruction cycle. Now, getting back to RAM. So RAM could be considered, so if the CPU is our brain, our RAM could be considered the short-term memory. Again, it stands for random access memory. Now, some things to note about it are that it is volatile. That means when the computer is turned off, all the data on the RAM is lost. Um, this also means that it's non-persistent storage. So the data is not going to remain on the RAM. 
Now, primary memory, primary memory is not only RAM, but also ROM. ROM is known as read-only memory, and it's used to store permanent instructions. So these are instructions that are the most basic instructions for a computer, including how to boot the computer. So that screen you see before, like the Microsoft, uh, like the Microsoft Windows screen, that's basically coming from the RAM. Or if you've ever tried to access the BIOS, that's also, sorry, ROM. Or if you've ever tried to access the BIOS, um, the BIOS screen to actually like overclock your computer or change your very fundamental settings in your computer. Or maybe um, if you've ever installed an operating system, you had to use the BIOS. Um, and the BIOS is stored in the RAM. Um, so that's basic input output system. These instructions that are fundamental to start to just even starting a computer, which allow the computer to start and function at a very basic level, are written in the factory and cannot ever be changed. And the ROM is also persistent. So even when the electricity turns off, that data on the ROM stays there. So collectively, the primary memory, or sorry, the primary memory consists of ROM, read-only memory, and RAM, random access memory. Now, something else we have is cache. So a cache stores frequently used instructions from RAM. Um, and the reason for this is because the, if we have the cache, so this is our CPU right here, right? And if we have instructions in the cache, or if we have a cache, the CPU is gonna check the cache first and see whether what it needs in the cache. If not, then it'll go to the primary memory. Um, however, it's the cache can speed things up because the cache is always gonna be closer to the CPU. So it's much faster for the CPU to retrieve data from the cache rather than go all the way to the primary memory. So remember, the cache is gonna sit between the CPU and the primary memory. Going back to our diagram right here, the cache would be, would be right here in between, right? That would sit between the CPU and the RAM. Now moving on, we've talked about primary memory, but secondary memory is our hard drive. We can think of this as long-term memory. It is considered to be persist persistent storage because when, the when you turn your computer off, the data is still there. It holds all data not currently in use. So for example, um, if you start up Microsoft Word, as soon as you start that program, that program gets put into your RAM. However, prior to that, all the data for that program, including the code, was stored in your um, secondary storage on your hard drive. It is slower and cheaper than primary memory, and secondary storage is not directly connected to the CPU. Additionally, RAM will come in uh, increments of like 2 gig, 4 gig, 8 gig, 16 gig, but hard drives you're more likely to see in, in, uh, in increments of, I don't know, like 512 gigabytes or a terabyte. So secondary memory will generally be slower, but also present in much larger amounts than primary memory. Now, virtual memory is something that we utilize when the primary memory is overloaded. Uh, a typical usage of this might be when running games, which are very memory intensive, or uh, video editing programs, like the one I'll use to edit this. Now, virtual memory is slower. Basically, what, what happens is uh, data from the RAM um, generally less used data is sent to the uh, hard disk, to the secondary memory. Um, and it's sent to a section of the secondary memory in units called pages. So we're sending the stuff to the secondary memory, and then when it's needed, it gets transferred back to the RAM. So the hard disk acts as kind of a backup for the RAM. Now, virtual memory is slower, and it's also temporary. So whenever your computer is going to have to use uh, virtual memory, uh, the programs involved or the programs currently running will generally run slower. Hence why having more RAM in your computer is always better in terms of performance. Now, this is a great chart, um, particularly if you're ever asked to compare the different uh, storage media. So smaller, co costlier, faster, larger, cheaper, slower. So the register is gonna be the smallest, costliest, and fastest piece of memory. Then you've got your L1 cache, your L2 and L3 cache, your system RAM, your permanent storage, which is gonna be your hard drive, and then your network storage, which is something you might access over an ethernet cord or over wireless. Now the next section is about operating systems. Now operating systems are defined, or an operating system is defined as a set of software that controls computers' hardware and resources and provides services for computer programs. Now broadly, 
there are five roles that operating system, well, there are five roles that operating systems play. They are a user interface, a memory management, peripheral management, multitasking, and security. And let's go over all five of these. Now, the user interface is the link between user and hardware. So this right here is an example of a user interface. However, this is specifically a graphical user interface. We can also have a command line interface, which is common. I mean, in fact, some operating systems, some Linux systems only have a command line interface, like so. We could have a natural language interface, which is something like Siri. And we could have a menu-based interface, which actually looks like this, but you don't really have commands that you type in. You just have like a menu for stuff you want to do, which kind of sucks. Um, that's something you might see in like a Game Boy, I suppose, or something like that. Uh, I'm not even, I can't even really think of a good example of when you'd see that. These are by far the most common. And for example, on, on either the Mac or Windows or any operating system, you usually have access to both. In a Mac computer, the CLI is the terminal app. In Windows, it's the command prompt. Now, the next role of an operating system is in memory management. So this involves keeping track of storage devices, allocating the appropriate amount of RAM to programs for them to have the optimal performance, uh, modifying memory locations, basically like, re like reorganizing or moving, moving uh, like data around in the RAM, um, just sorting data, again, just having the optimal configuration of data on RAM or on disk drives for the most efficient performance or for the highest efficiency, organizing data into folders and copying the leading files like the trash can, that's memory management. We also have peripheral management, peripherals being things like keyboards, mice, and monitors. So what the operating system does with peripheral management is it um, coordinates with the, with the BIOS, which is that very fundamental part of the computer that's stored in ROM. Um, it uses device, device drivers, which are just small programs um, whose purpose are to interface with peripherals. So basically manages that interaction between the um, computer and peripherals by utilizing these device drivers that either come with the operating system or are installed by the user. Uh, basically, like it allows us to use peripherals without thinking too much about it. Um, we've also multitasking, and multitasking um, involves the allocation of CPU cycles, FDE cycles, to programs that are running at the same time based on priority and time. Uh, each program is given a slice of time, right, turn to use the CPU for a certain number of cycles. These slices can vary in length of time. So basically what, what it's doing is it's allowing multiple programs to run at the same time. And the operating system is basically coordinating their usage of the CPU. So they're all able to work at work optimally at the same time. Um, it's basically like, I guess it's basically like a gatekeeper for the CPU. So basically allows uh, programs to access the CPU only when it says so that everything works smoothly. Um, actually, if you do HO, I believe it's either in like topic six or topic se topic seven. I can't remember which one it is, but we go more into detail about these like slices and this sort of process uh, in that topic in HO. And finally, we have security. Um, it could be something as simple as username and password, user permissions. So certain users in the OS can access um, certain files and others can't. And then file permissions for reading and writing. Again, certain programs or, even, or certain users or even certain programs can read and write to certain folders while others can't. Now, this is kind of trivial and kind of ridiculous, actually. That I mean, but one thing you do need to know apparently is just the names of three types of application software. Um, so, like, really, you just need to be able to mention, like, or like, nor mention two to three of these. So, you have a word processor, which is like Microsoft Word, spreadsheet software, which is like Microsoft Excel, uh, a database management system, which is like Microsoft Access, an email client, which is like Outlook, or I guess Mail on Mac web browser, which is like Chrome, which you're probably watching this in. Uh, a, you need to, I guess you, I don't know if you like, you need to know that computer aided design software is an application software. I don't think you need to know what it is, but in any case, this is an example of computer aided design software. It allows you to design objects, um, design buildings, design things in, on the computer and graphic processing software, which is basically, which an example is Photoshop. So you just need to know that like three of these are applications that will run on a computer. As ridiculous as that might sound. Keep in mind, like this was created in 2014. Like I guess people were already like pretty tech savvy in 2014, but I mean, 
Apparently not. Um, our next section is going to be data representation. And this is probably where we're going to have the most sort of math. Now, data representation hinges on the fact that data in computers is represented in the form of bits, which constitute bytes. Now, um, bits, ones and zeros are binary code. And those are that's like the language that computers speak. Every operation like any code that you write in a computer is going to eventually get translated to ones and zeros to be interpreted interpreted by the CPU. What you do need to know is this right here. One byte is eight bits. One kilobyte is 1024 bytes. One megabyte is 1024 kilobytes. One gigabyte is 1024 megabytes. One terabyte is 1024 gigabytes. You need to know this, particularly this one right here, because you might get a question about how many bits is this? How many bytes is this? How many gigabyte, how many bytes is in a gigabyte, that sort of thing. So make sure that you pay attention to this. Now, just to give you an idea of like what, like how stuff is stored in terms of bits and bytes, like one character, like an A in a text file is gonna be one byte or eight bits, which essentially means like eight binary values, all right? Um, an email will be two kilobytes. A three minute audio file will be three megabytes. A movie is four gigabytes. Um, so at, at, like at its core, you're still talking about ones and zeros, but depending on the kind of data you are storing, number of ones and zeros gets massively bigger. Now, binary, as we said, is a language of the CPU in modern computing. Um, there are two possible values in binary, it's one and zero. And binary is what's called uh, base two. So it's basically you're representing uh, values in a base two format. And honestly, I'm not a mathematician. So if that terminology is incorrect, don't write that in the comments. Well, actually do write that in the comments, but just don't hold me accountable for that. Anyways, what I'm going to show you next is how to convert from binary to denary. Now, denary is decimal values or the numbers we are used to seeing. So on the IB exam, you need to be able to convert between both of them. So here's a great example, actually. Um, convert the 8-bit binary number 00011010. Now, this is an 8-bit binary number because there are eight digits here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I, okay, I'm not going to count all that. Um, so we want to take this the 0, the 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, and convert that to a decimal um, value. And the decimal value is 26. And the way we know that is that basically this is base 2, right? So that means that starting from right here, this represents two to the power of zero. This represents two to the power of one, two to the power of two, two to the power of three, two to the power of four, two to the power of five, two to the power of six, and two to the power of seven. So what we're doing is we're basically adding up all the value, all the um, values where there's a one. So we've got a one right here. So we're going to go. We're going to write down two to the power, power of four plus. We've got a one right here, so we're going to write two to the power of three plus. We don't we have a zero right here, so we're not going to write that down. And we have a one right here, so we're going to do two to the power of one. And these numbers represent um, these right here. So really, we're going to have 16 uh, plus eight plus two, which equals 26, which is our which is our ultimate answer. So I'm going to do like two exercises. Um, the first one is going to be this value right here. I'm just going to do some examples. So let's get started. Okay, so the first value we have right here is 11101001. So I'm going to write that right here. 110, uh, God, I messed it up. 11101001. So that's going to be 2 to the power of 0, 2 to the power of 1, 2 to the power of 2, 2 to the power of 3 to the power of four, uh, to the power of five, to the power of six, and to the power of seven. Okay. So right here, so we've got to the power of seven because there's a one there, plus to the power of six because there's a one there, plus to the power of five because there's a one there. We're not going to do to the power of four because there's a zero there. To the power of three because there's a one there. We're not going to do two to the power of two or two to the power of one because there's zeros there, and to the power of zero because there is a one there. So this is going to be 1, 8, 16, 32, 64, 
and 128. And that should give us 233. Now, similarly, right here, we've got uh, 100, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. So again, to the power of zero. Actually, you could just add, you could just write the numbers. So to the power of zero is going to be one, two, four, uh, eight, 16, uh, 32, 64, 128. So for 128, we've got a one, so we're gonna do 128, plus 64, we got a zero, 32, we got a zero, 16, we got a zero, and then for eight, we've got a one, uh, four, we've got a one, and to the power of one, we've got a zero, and then to the power of zero, we've got a one, which is gonna be one. So that's gonna be 136, plus four plus one equals 141. Now the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna learn how to convert from denary to binary. So that means going from a number like 26 to, how do we figure that out? So the way we figure that out is we wanna look for the biggest number in this chart that fits into 26. So 32 is bigger than 26, so that's gonna be zero, that's gonna be zero, and that's gonna be zero. But 16 is the biggest number that fits into 26, so that's where we're gonna start with the one. Now, if we choose 16, we're gonna do 26 minus 16, and now we have 10 left over. Now, what's the biggest number that fits into 10? That's eight. So we can put a one right here. We can subtract eight, and then we have two left over. And what's the biggest number that fits into two? Well, that's just gonna be two, so we can have that right there. All the others will have zeros. Now let's go do some examples. So right here we've got 168, all right? So we need to think about our, we need to take a look at our chart right back here. So again, we're basically gonna like write down all the numbers that we have access to, right? So it's gonna be 128, uh, 64, uh, 32, 16, eight, four, two and one, which correspond to two to the power of zero, two to the power of one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what's the biggest number that fits into 168? That's gonna be one. So if we do 168 minus 128, we get 40 left over. Now what's the biggest number that fits into, th into 40? That's 32, so we're gonna put a one right there. And 64 is too big, so we're just gonna put a zero right there. Um, so we do 40 minus 32 equals eight. And what's the number that fits into, what's the biggest number here that fits into eight? And that's eight right here. So we're gonna put a one right there and eight minus eight equals zero, so we're done. We can put zeros everywhere else. So we're going, we're trying to find the biggest number that fits into our uh, denary number and then we're moving this direction, okay? So we started with 128. Once we accounted for 128, we had 40 left over. And then we tried to find the next value, the next biggest value that fits into 40, that was 32. And we subtracted 32 to, from 40 and we got eight. So then we tried to find the next biggest value that fit into eight and that was just eight. Um, and everything else was a zero. Now we still got 83 right here. Uh, we can still use the same chart. What's the biggest number that fits into 83? That's gonna be one right here. You can put it automatically put a zero right there. Uh, 83, minus 60, uh, 83 minus 64 equals, uh, what is that? That's gonna be 19. So what's the biggest number that fits into 19? That's gonna be 16. You can put a zero right there. What's the biggest number that fits into three? That's gonna be two. You can put a zero right there and a zero right there. We have one left over and we can put a one right there and then we get our answer. So you're gonna find the biggest number that fits into your uh, denary, your decimal number, the biggest one of these numbers, and then work your way uh, rightwards from there in a rightly direction, in an easterly direction. Okay, now the next type of value we're gonna work with is hexadecimal. Now, hexadecimal is used to efficiently represent large binary values. Um, to represent colors, if you've done any HTML or CSS, you've probably used hex, to, uh, hex for color codes to represent specific colors. Uh, memory addresses, as we said before, uh, MAC addresses, which we went over in uh, topic three, our networks topic. 
and hexadecimal is base 16. So for example, with a binary value, right, you've got one, zero, one, one. This is to the power of zero, to the power of one, to the power of two, to the power of three. Well, in, ba in base 16, first of all, it's not just one and zero. It's zero through F because you have, you have 15 different ways or 16 different ways to represent values, right? And you're gonna have 16 to the power of zero. So you're gonna have 16 to the power of zero, 16 to the power of one, 16 to the power of two, 16 to the power of three. Although this is pretty big, we normally never get to these. Normally we just have two digit, we have two, um, we have six, we just have two digit hexadecimal numbers, at least on the IB exam. And so for example, if you have like uh, F right here and two right here, that's gonna be two times 16 to the power of one plus 15 times 16 to the power of zero. If you look at this chart right here, it makes a bit more sense. So hexadecimal has 15 possible digits, it's base 16, and this is what they correspond to. And yeah, they have letters, it's weird, you'll get over it. So right here, for example, we have 2A5, okay? Now, two is pretty simple. So right here, we're gonna do two times 16 squared for this digit right here. We're gonna add that to, well, we have A in our next digit right here, and A just corresponds to 10. So we're gonna have 10 times 16 to the power of one squared. And we're gonna add those. And then our last digit, we have five, which is pretty straightforward. And that's 16 to the power of zero. So we're gonna have five times 16 to the power of zero. And if we add all those up, that gives us 677. So it's actually just like binary, except instead of having two to the power of zero, you have 16 to the power of zero, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're going to go over some examples right here. So right here we have three, and this, these are some examples for converting from a hex value to a denary or a regular number as we know it, a decimal number. So we've got 3b right here, and that's going to be 16 to the power of 0, 16 to the power of 1. So we're going to do 3 times 16 to the power of 1 plus b, if we go back to our chart, represents uh, 11. So we're going to do... 11 times 16 to the power of zero. And that's gonna be like 48 plus 11 equals 59. Um, right here, we've got a slightly larger example. So we're gonna have 18E. So we're gonna have um, 16 to the power of zero, 16 to the power of one, and 16 to the power of two. Now, 16 to the power of two is 256. So we're gonna have one times uh, well, we'll just write 16 to the power of, well, we'll just write 256, honestly, uh, plus 8 times 16 plus, uh, what is E? E is 14 right here. So we're going to have 14 times 1, and that's going to equal 398. I just know that because I did the work beforehand. I'm not a human calculator. In fact, I'm not even really that good at math. Um, and yeah, so the thing is, like, on the IB exam, you will like you will most likely be asked to do such a conversion, and you're going to have to know what the letters correspond to. Okay, so make sure you memorize that, and actually, even rather than memorizing it, just do a bunch of problems, and you'll have internalized it quite easily. But make sure that you know that for the IB exam. Okay, now uh, similar to binary, we're also going to learn how to uh, convert between um, convert from denary to hexadecimal, which essentially follows the same process. Okay, so now what we're going to do, uh, similar to what we did with binary, is learn how to convert between denary and hexadecimal. So right here, um, we can represent, so we want to convert 480 to 1E0, okay? So basically the way we want to think about this, okay, this is a bit more complicated than with binary. So our first digit is 16 to the power of 0, okay? So the maximum, the highest number we can have here is F, which represents 15. So the highest amount we can represent with this is going to be 15. Okay. Um, now we have 16 to the power of 1 for our next digit. Now if this is F, the highest number we can represent is going to be 15 times 16. Now that's going to be equal to 160 plus 80, which is going to be equal to 240. So we can represent at most 240 in this spot, 
okay? And now in a third digit, 16 to the power of two, if we have F here, the most we can represent is 15 times 256, which I am not gonna to try to calculate. So we know 480 is bigger than 240, than our maximum possible value here, and obviously it's bigger than 15. So we're probably gonna start right here. Now, the biggest value we can put into 480 is going to be, is going to be one, really. So we're gonna have one, um, because if we do one times 256, we just get 256. If we do two times 256, we get 512, which is already bigger than, um, than 480. So we're gonna have a one for our first digit. Um, and then we're gonna have, we're basically gonna do um, 480 minus 256. And that is going to require a calculator for, for me. Um, I would say, so it's gonna be 200 and then um, it's going to be 200 and then 224, right? So it's going to equal 224. So now we need to figure out how to get 224. Well, we're, so basically in this, in our next digit right here, where so we have 16 to the power of two, for 16 to the power of zero, um, we're going to see how we can fit 224. And it's probably going to be E because 240, uh, minus 16. Well, 240 was equivalent to F and minus 16 equals 224. So we're gonna have E right here. 15 times 16 equals 224. And actually, we got, we, we took care of all that was left, so we're just gonna have a zero right here for 16 power of one. Now that was a bit complicated. Um, you're not going to have, you're probably not gonna have a number this big on the IB exam, but it was just to kind of illustrate the concept. Um, now for 232, so if we remember right here, um, we actually had E, E was 224. Um, and um, we can have a maximum value of 240 in the uh, second for this digit. So we're 16, we have 16 to the power of one, we're gonna have E, because if you have F that's 240. And um, so if we do 232 minus 224, uh, we get eight. So that's gonna be E8. Now, this is just like a quick overview of how to convert between hex and hex and denary and binary and denary and vice versa. Um, I'm not like, like there are a lot of tutorials out, out there to cover this. Um, the purpose of these slides is really just more to cover very IB specific stuff that you can't really find everywhere and put it into one space. So if you don't completely understand this, want to see it explained in a different way, I invite you to just YouTube it because there are a lot of videos on how to do this. It's a pretty common process. Um, now, one of the more important things is to convert between like hexadecimal and binary. And I'm just going to illustrate, I'm probably not going to do all of these, but like the way that this works is, let's say we have 3b, okay? Uh, 3b is a hexadecimal digit. 3 just represents 3 in denary, and b represents, uh, I want to say that's like 11 in, uh, in hexadecimal. Because nine is nine, A is 10, and then B is 11. So um, a really easy way to think about this is what is three and what is B? 11 in binary is gonna be one. So it's gonna be one, one, uh, zero, one. So the biggest number that can fit into 11 is eight. So we're gonna put one. Um, and then we have three left over, so we're gonna have one and one. Okay, so that's B. And three in binary is just zero, zero, one, one. Okay, so if we put these together, we get zero, zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, one, one, which is the same thing as this. So if you wanna convert from hexadecimal to binary, you just split them up into individual digits. You figure out what their um, like denary value is. And then you just find the binary value of that, okay? Uh, similarly, right here, we have one, one, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, okay? What is this in denary? That's gonna be one, okay, so one, two, four, uh, eight. So that's gonna be 13 in denary, right? It's that first part. That second part is going to be um, two and four, so six. 
two plus four is six, okay? So basically what I'm trying to say is every four hexadecimal digits represents, or every four binary digits represents a hexadecimal digit, okay? These four represented this, these four represented this, and right here, 13 in hexadecimal is D, and six is just six. So our answer is gonna be D6. And this is an example of how hexadecimal can be a shorter way to represent binary. So in order to convert between them, what you need to know is that every hexadecimal digit is equivalent to four binary digits. All you need to do is change each hexadecimal digit to denary and then convert that to binary. So here we converted 1101 to, look at here, we converted three to, well, we knew three was just three and B was 11 and we just converted those to binary and we got this. Vice versa, we could have just taken our binary values uh, like this four, we convert to 13, and then we convert that to six, and then we just got D6. So it's actually a lot more simple than converting between denary and hexadecimal. Now, next we're talking about like data representation in the larger sense. So basically strings are made up of characters. Um, each character has an eight bit representation or a one byte representation. There are two formats, ASCII and Unicode. Now ASCII was kind of the original uh, data representation format. And that usually, that actually uses about seven bits. And then uh, one more bit, I think that's for error, um, for detecting errors. Yeah, it's a, it's a parity bit, which is for detecting errors. And um, just kind of to go back. So you've got seven bits to represent each character and one bit just to make sure there's no error. And seven bits, so two times seven means there are 128 possible combinations. Um, that's gonna include uh, you know, spaces, punctuation, etc. Now the other, other format we have is Unicode, and there are a lot more bits because we can represent a lot more languages using Unicode. So for example, Chinese characters, uh, Arabic, or just any other language really. Um, again, just a review of ASCII, seven bits for each character. Uh, we also have punctuation included, 128 possible characters. Uh, these can also be um, represented by hex, as we see right here in this column and with the other columns. Um, this is an example of like the most recent version of Unicode, where we can like represent like dinosaurs and stuff. Um, but generally, we have UTF-8, which is 8 bits, UTF-16, which is 16 bits, UTF-32, which is 32 bits. Obviously, the higher standard of UTF we're using, the more bits we can use to represent characters, and the more characters we have access to, the more languages we have access to. Now, we talked about characters. Um, we're gonna talk about, um, well, we just talked about characters. Now we're gonna talk about how images are displayed. Now, um, each display, each monitor or phone screen, it's divided into pixels, and pixels are little squares. So your screen is basically a grid of little squares called, pixel, called pixels. And each of these squares can be controlled um, in order to represent a specific color at a specific moment. So for example, if you have, you're representing this photo right here, this is made up of a bunch of pixels and each pixel is showing a different color that collectively make up this image. Now, if you have a video, those pixels are constantly changing in order to represent the particular still at any given moment. Now each color represented in a pixel is a combination of red, blue, and green. And other colors besides these are a combination of all three um, as determined by uh, how, like basically there's some variation or some mixture of all three in different shades. Now, if we say that a monitor has a 1024 by 764 screen resolution, that means it is a 1024 pixels high, 764 wide, um, we, you've probably seen other um, descriptions of screen resolution, like 1080p, HD, and 4K, and these all refer to increasing number, to basically the number of pixels on the screen. Um, we can represent a, each, the color of each pixel using a six-digit hexadecimal code. The first two digits from the left represent red, the second two represent green, and the third two represent blue, and we can represent different colors using some mixture of these, right? So for example, orange is gonna be whatever shade FF represents, whatever shade eight zero, whatever shade of red FF represents, whatever shade of, uh, of green eight zero represents, and whatever shade of blue zero zero represents, which is actually probably nothing. 
Um, okay, so that's a lot. Now we're going to move on to logic gates, but just kind of in conclusion, that is pretty much all you need to know about um, how data is represented, both as characters and on the screen. Um, there are other com there are other questions. The most common question is like, how many possible color combinations can represent this? Or just some question about what the role of pixels are. And in order to see those questions, please take a look at the link in the description. Um, because I'm, linked, I'm linking the slideshow, and I'm not going to show you the IB questions just for copyright reasons. But if you check out the slideshow, um, which is linked in the description, um, at the end of the slideshow, there's a bunch of IB questions. And you can see uh, how these concepts are approached in the actual IB exam. They're all past IB questions. Now, the last section is going to be logic gates. This is probably like, it's, a, I mean, you need to, like, there is something involved. I'm not going to say it's quantitative, but it's kind of in that direction. But a lot of students actually seem to enjoy this the most for some reason. So basically, the concept behind logic gates is a logic gate takes one to two inputs of one or zero and outputs either a one or a zero. Um, a one being represented by a high voltage electrical signal and a, z and a zero being represented by a low voltage electrical signal. Now, a CPU is made up of thousands or millions of these logic gates. And it's basically, um, basically, there are various patterns of logic gates that represent any of the operations that a CPU would want to conduct. It's basically made up of, of a bunch of logic gates um, and they can be configured into whatever pattern is necessary in order to accomplish a task. And these are all just taking ones and zeros and outputting either a one or a zero. So these are four, um, or actually six logic gates. So this is, this is a not gate. This would take in um, a, for example, this would take in a, this will basically output the opposite of whatever is put in. So oftentimes you can think of a zero as a false and a one as a true. That's kind of how I look at it. So if we put a zero here, we're going to return a one. And if you put a one in here, we're going to return a zero. So if you put a false in here, we'll return a true. If you put a false, if we put a true in here, then we'll return a false. Now this is an AND gate right here. Now with an AND, if both of the inputs um, are different. Wait, hold on. Okay. If we put in a, um, if you put in a false and a false, like a zero and a zero, we're going to end up with false. If we have any zeros or we have any falses, right, we're going to end up with a zero. The only case in which you have an output of a one or a true is when we have two trues. So two trues equals a true, but if there's any false in the form of a zero, then our output's going to be a false. Now, an or gate is an opposite. Um, so if we put in like a, uh, a one, a one and a zero, a true and a false, we're still going to get a true. We put in a zero and a one, we're still going to get a true. If you put in a one and a one, we're obviously going to get a true. The only time we're going to get a false is if we put in a zero and a zero, which represents a false and a false. And that's this case right here. Um, so this is going to be an XOR gate. And basically an XOR gate outputs a false um, whenever both of the inputs are the same. So if you have a zero, zero, or a one, one, so we can say false, false, or a true, true, we're gonna have a false. Now, if we have two different inputs, like a zero, one, or a one, zero, our output's gonna be a one or a true. So if you have zero, one, or one, zero, our output's gonna be one, which we can also represent as true. Now, these are just variations of these. This is a NAND. And this is a this is a nor, and it's basically an AND gate with a nor with a not in front of it, with a not gate in front of it. Um, and as we'll see later, we can actually chain together these logic gates so that we take the input from this one, put it through another gate, and then we get the resultant output. So as you can see here, um, so first of all, these things right here are called uh, truth tables. So they basically show every possible um, input and every possible output. So for example, when we only have two inputs, we have our pot, when we only have two, we have A and B right here. Our possible inputs are 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and we're writing down all of the outputs from those. Right here for a not gate, we only have one input, so our only options for input are 0 and 1. And our outputs are 1 and 0. Now, as you can see in the, in the truth table, 
And NAND and a NOR is basically not AND and not OR. So if you think about what that means in like lexical terms, like as words, then everything here is the opposite of everything here. So for example, with an AND gate, normally if we have if we have any zeros, if you have any falses, then we're going to have a false. But in NAND, if you have any falses, or if you have any zeros, we're going to get a true. And similarly, if, you have, if both are one, if both are true, then we're going to get a false. So NAND and NOR are the mere image of AND and OR. So right here, the figure below shows a logic gate and its incomplete truth table. Complete the truth table below. So these are all our possible outputs of A and B. Okay. Now these A and B go into a gate. This is an OR gate. Remember how OR works. If there is one true in either of these, then we're going to get true. One true or one one, right? A one is one equals true and zero equals false. So zero, zero is going to be zero. This one has a one, so it's going to be true. This one has a one, so it's going to be true. And this one has a one, so it's going to be true. So remember, the C here represents the output when we input both A and B, which is why we're writing these numbers right here. So now that we've gotten right here, we have our output at C right here. Now, whatever output was here from the OR gate, that's going to go through uh, this gate right here, which is a NOT gate. Remember, a NOT gate just, re just reverses any input that we have. So the zero is going to become a one, the one's going to become a zero, the one's going to become a zero, and the one's going to become a zero. And that's our answer. Now right here it says the figure below shows a logic gate and its incomplete truth table. Complete its truth table. So again, we have our A and B inputs right here, right? So C is going to be right here. Now C is taking in the, well, so we have this gate here that's taking in A and B and outputting C. Now this gate is an OR gate. So we just saw an OR gate. Remember, if there's any, if there's a one at all, then we're going to get a one. If there's a true at all, we're going to get a true. So this is going to be false, zero, true, one, true, one, true, one. But also we have this wire right here that's going from B um, into another gate, which is AND. It's sort of sneaky. So at this AND gate right here, we're going to have the inputs of C, which we saw right here and D, which is this really B in disguise. So Q, which is the output from this gate, is going to be um, the output after C and D are put into an AND gate right here. Now, D is just B, right? Because we're just going straight from here to D. So we already know D is going to be 0, um, 1, 0, 1. And both these are going into an AND. So we want to find C and D. Now remember with an AND, if there is, if there's any, so the only time where we have a true or a one is if there are two trues. So this one's gonna be one, uh, this one's gonna be one, and these are gonna be zero and zero. And that's gonna be our answer. So here's another last example. This is XOR, okay? Now this one's a bit more complex, okay? Um, we have, a and B. So we've got A right here and we've got B right here. So in this truth table, A and B are just going to be tra tradition. So we have A right here. For some reason, they didn't put B. But A and B are just going to be all of our possible outputs, right? So we're going to have 0, 1, uh, 0, 0, and then uh, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Now, first, let's look at C. So this is a bit sneaky, but we have A and B going into an OR gate to get C. So what's going to happen is, remember, with OR, um, if we have a 1 at all, it's just going to be 1. So we have C right there. And D is just a result of B going through a NOT gate. So remember, a NOT gate reverses whatever the input is. So this is our B right here, and D is just going to be B after the NOT gate. So it's going to be the reverse of B. So it's going to be 0, 1, 1, 0. Now uh, Q is going to be the output when we put C or D through Q. So it's going to be C, X, or 
D. So remember what an XOR was. If we go back to our chart, so right here, this is our XOR. So if our A and B are the same, we have a zero or a false. If they're different, then we have a true. So we're comparing one and zero. So if they're the same, we have a false. If they are different, we have a true. If they're the same, we have a false. If they're different, we have a true. So these are the same, so we're gonna have a false, which is zero. All the other ones are different, so we're gonna have a true, which is one. So this is gonna be our output. Now this is a very common question, like these types of questions are very common. Uh, let's look at how we can actually um, draw uh, equations that are given to us, which is another type of question. We'll just look at, at it at a simple example or two. So let's just say that we have um, A and B, okay? Basically the way we're showing that is gonna be A and B, okay? And we're gonna have uh, one, zero, zero, one, one, or one, zero, zero, one, one, one for A and B. And A and B is gonna be, um, so remember, they have to both be true or both be one to get a result of one or true. So we're gonna have one, zero, zero, zero. Now, what we can do is we can expand upon this to create different patterns of gates. So let's say we want A and, A and not B. We're gonna start outwards. So we're gonna start with the A and the not B and then draw those first and then we'll work our way into the end, okay? Now, how this is gonna work is we are going to say A and not B. You remember what the not gate was? This was the not gate. Now, if we put some value, let's say we put X here, we have Y, okay? We have two possible values of X. If we do zero, one, our Y is gonna be one, zero. So it's basically making the opposite of whatever input we put in there. And it's represented this way. So we're gonna draw A, that's gonna be our input, and then B, but we're going to have a not gate for B. So whatever input, whatever one or zero we put in here, the not gate is immediately gonna reverse it. And both of those are gonna be joined into an AND gate, which is represented this way. So that's kind of like what we're getting at here. We're chaining together logic gates, we're looking at the inputs. Um, you're gonna to have to both draw diagrams, interpret draw diagrams, and draw truth tables. So let's draw some gates, okay? We can chain gates together. So we have X or not Y. So basically we have, we have an X input and a Y input. We have two inputs. And we're connecting a not Y with an OR. So basically we wanna start our way outwards and work our way in. So we're gonna do X and we're gonna do Y, but we're gonna put a not gate because not Y. And then both of those are going to go into an OR gate. Now, if we wanna make a truth table for this, what we're gonna say is we have two inputs, right? So we have X and Y. So let's look at this, right? We have X and we have Y. Um, we can have zero, zero. So X are both zero. We can have X, or, X is zero and one. We can have X is one and zero, and, or we can have X is one and Y is zero, or we can have X is one and Y is one. Now, right here in, our, in this right here, we have not Y. So that's gonna be the opposite of everything here. It's gonna be one, zero, one, zero. And our final result is X, X or not Y. So X or not Y. So if we have 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and 1, 0, which are X or not Y, and we wanna do an OR between these. So we wanna put both of these values into an OR gate, okay? So you want 0, 1, and then 0, 0, and then 1, 1, and then 1, 0. That's gonna be our result. So zero is considered false and one is considered true. Remember for an OR gate, if we have a false and a true, we're still gonna get a true. If we have two falses, uh, then we're gonna get a false. It's probably the only situation. If you have two trues, we're gonna get a true. Sorry, a false is represented by a zero. 
we have two trues, we're going to get a true. Two ones, we're going to get a one. If we have a one and zero, we're going to get a one, which is a true. So here, our final output is going to be one, zero, one, one. So basically what we're doing is we're getting our x's and y's, and then looking at our equation, we're figuring out what gates are going to be where, and then we're going to create a truth table to show all the possible outputs and inputs. So initially, like I was going to show you these examples, um, but these represent three inputs, which you will never see on the IB exam. If you're doing IGCSE, then you may see it. So this is just what we're worried about. Now that takes us to IB questions. Um, again, particularly with like logic gates and hexadecimal and binary, those are just starting points. I, I don't like, uh, I kind of gave you something to work with, but I didn't want to go too much into detail with it. Like I didn't feel the need to go into detail with it too much. Again, for both of those, there's a huge number of resources online. Um, so th these are, this is a starting point. Um, the point of these slides is just to give you all the information that you need in one place. And then if there's something you don't understand or just want to get further grasp on, at least you know what it is, and then you can go um, pursue that further. Now, again, you can find these IB questions um, in the slideshow that is linked in the description. Um, I'm just not going to put them up for copyright reasons. Um, but yeah, again, just look at the slideshow. If you want to see more videos like this, then please remember to like this video and subscribe to this channel. Also, feel free to comment if you have any questions or um, you have any videos you want me to make, particularly related to the IB. Additionally, if you have questions, uh, besides writing in the comments, you can also uh, check out the Discord where others can help you or I can help you. There is a, uh, there is a channel for just IB questions. Anyways, have a nice day.